Well, uh, thank you, Rachel, and thank you all for uh, coming tonight and giving up a beautiful summer's evening and the chance to watch uh, Andy Murray. Um, uh, dealing with big ideas makes me rather nervous. I'm always reminded of when I was director of IPPR, and someone said of me, Matthew Taylor is the director of IPPR. It's a think tank. Unfortunately, Matthew is more tank than think. Um, <laughs> I, that's not an impression that I confirm tonight. Um, I should thank uh, all my colleagues at the RSA who helped with this speech. I also give particular thanks to one person who you won't see. You might uh, wonder as the slides start to move whether I'm controlling them with my mind, which would be in keeping with the speech. Um, uh, but in fact, they're being controlled by my fantastic pay, Barbara Corbett. And I'm just paying tribute to Barbara because her, the big love of Barbara's life is tennis. And she has given up centre court tickets today in order to do the slides. So I'd like to start with a round of applause for Barbara. Okay. Um, well, thank you, David, for agreeing to respond um, to a speech which, um, I don't know whether you knew this when I asked you to respond, but it does stray far beyond the usual terrain of policy uh, debate. Uh, in essence, this speech is about a hunch. Uh, it's a hunch that A plus B could equal C, where A is the overwhelming evidence that who we are as human beings is quite different to how we tend to think of ourselves, where B is the idea that we face huge new challenges created by human progress and that we may need fundamentally to change the ways we think and behave to meet those challenges. And C is the suggestion that we could therefore see a paradigm shift in the way that we think about ourselves. Now, some of the facts and ideas I'll describe are difficult to accept, but none of them are in the slightest bit new. It's not new to say that there's a problem with our intuitive idea of self. It's not new to argue that we need to transcend the Western idea of selfhood but the power of ideas like that of people is not inherent, it relies on context. And my question today is whether the challenges our species now faces might provide the context for what could be called a new enlightenment. So let's start with the modern self. Who are you? Now you might answer with your name, maybe your profession, your achievements, maybe the letters after your name. By the way, well done. <laughs> but you might find it harder if I asked you to describe yourself as an entity. What is the thing that constitutes the thing that you are? This is, I think, how it feels to be you. First, the conscious you. This is the person talking to you all the time. It's the voice in your head. And if you just ask yourself what voice, well, that is the voice. It's who we mean by I and who we mean by myself when we say, I said to myself. Secondly, the separate you. Although you can't control what happens to you, you do feel you're in control of your interaction with the world outside your head, including other people. You feel there's a clearly drawn and important boundary between the inner you and the outside world. Third, that your behavior and decisions are self-determined and broadly consistent with your values and preferences. Now, even if on reflection you question these intuitions, they are the foundation of our day-to-day -day sense of self. But the foundations of modern selfhood are shaky. Shaky because they don't stand up to scientific scrutiny, and shaky because they may not be helping us lead good and fulfilled lives. By the way, I'm not saying that the self is inherently selfish. I am saying it tends to perceive itself not only as the center of the universe, but as the cardinal unit of social reality. Now, the self already has many powerful enemies. Despite its monotheistic origins, the modern idea of selfhood is bemoaned by Christians for its shallowness and materialism. It's seen as a delusion by Buddhists, for whom life's purpose is its abandonment. From poets to prophets, from psychologists to postmodernists, the self has had a bad press. But on the whole, this makes not a jot of difference the way we live our lives and think of ourselves. And even the biggest blow that's been landed against the dominance of selfhood, the discovery of the Freudian unconscious, has been subject to popular reinterpretation. For Freud, the relationship between the three aspects of the psyche, id, superego, and ego, was one of functional interdependence. But the public understanding of the subconscious is more that it's a problematic adjunct to the self, a form of vulnerability and irrationality caused by, revealed during moments of emotional stress. So why is it that our own sense of self survives the chorus of disapproval? 
put simply because it works. This is how life feels. I am in control of me is the only premise upon which I can imagine living day to day. It provides the tools I need to make my way in an individualistic world. The objective basis of selfhood lies on the one hand in our species' unique capacity for mental reflexivity, and on the other in the major cultural forces of maternity, modernity, scientific rationality, individualism, urbanization, consumer capitalism. In the terms of evolutionary psychology, the triumph of the self lies in the interaction of hardwired genes and powerful memes. Much of the economic and cultural triumph of the West can be laid at the door of modern selfhood. It's driven us to attain levels of affluence beyond the dreams of our ancestors, more progress in science and technology in two centuries than in the previous 140,000 years, more individual freedom for more people than ever before. The spectacular rise of China and India are in part the result of the global diffusion of the values and assumptions of Western selfhood. But what if this forward march were to be halted? What if the scientific evidence conflicting with our sense of self became so great none of us could ignore it? What if we came to feel that the challenges facing the human species now require us to change our ideas of ourselves? What if we started to see and appreciate a different way of being? Now, I'm going to suggest five conclusions that can be drawn from neuroscience, behavioral science, and newly emerging areas such as social neuroscience. Together, these five conclusions pretty much demolish the common sense idea we have of ourselves. First, not only is there no me inside my head, distinct from the physical processes of my brain, but that which occurs to us as consciousness is a large an epiphenomenon of automatic mental processes of which we are unaware. Catchy, huh? <laughs> Two, the idea that our conscious self effectively polices the boundaries between us and the world outside us is an illusion. Now, it's long been known that certain cognitive functions are related to specific areas of the brain, Ever since 1848, when an unfortunate railway worker called Phineas Gage was pierced through his forehead by a steel girder and survived with all his faculties intact but unable to remember anything, we've known that memory is somehow related to the hippocampus. But modern neuroimaging techniques, such as fMRI, allow us to see much further, showing more clearly than ever before the physiological basis of thought and emotion. Now, neuroscience is a rapidly expanding and well-funded area of research. As its insights deepen and spread, so we will be more and more confronted by the absence in our heads of this mysterious me intermediating the physical processes of my brain. The science also tells us that what happens in that part of the brain where conscious thought arises, the neocortex, is chemically and electri electrically dependent on things happening in the other non-conscious parts of my brain. In the wonderfully mixed metaphor of a fellow leaving a recent neuroscience lecture here at the RSA, it's just another nail in the coffin of the ghost in the machine. <laughs> a further blow to our sense of self comes from the revelation that our thought and behavior is largely a consequence of unconsciously received inputs and unconsciously generated outputs. Ever since the groundbreaking work of Benjamin Libet and Associates over 25 years ago, it's been known that when we take an action, the associated neural process begins up to half a second before we think of the action. This insight, popularized in Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book, Blink, demonstrates that the thought we are aware of simply confirms an action we've embarked upon automatically. As the science fiction writer Robert Heinlein says, man is not a rational animal, but a rationalizing one. Now, it's humbling to see that thought follows action rather than preceding it, but another implication is perhaps more profound. If what we think and what we do is in large part the consequence of unconscious processing, it challenges the myth of the separate self. Instead of a self which polices the boundary between the inner me and the outside world, the reality is that our minds are embedded as unique nodes in a complex web of external stimuli. Our selves are continuous with the world that we occupy, especially the social world. In his book, Social Intelligence, Daniel Goleman summarizes evidence from the emerging field of social neuroscience that our interactions with people take place through what he calls the low road of unconscious processing. For example, two people having an intense conversation in the same space, not able to see each other, will soon be replicating not only each other's brain patterns, but also physical manifestations, like crossing their legs or stroking their face. You may believe you're now reacting to me because you are thinking about what I'm saying, but there's also a whole other conversation between us of which we're not aware, but which is shaping your responses, including what you think that you're thinking. 
The third point is that the way that we think and behave is as much a consequence of the context we're in as of our individual identity. The famous obedience experiments by Stanley Milgram in which randomly selected students were on instruction more than willing to administer pain to strangers provided the basis for the situationist argument that character is given more by context than by inherent traits. More recently, Philip Zimbardo's Stanford Prison Experiment provided graphic evidence that if most of us are put in a situation that encourages and incentivizes sadism, well, we'll soon get in touch with our inner sadist. On the upside, the initiatives of charities like the amazing Dance United you'll hear on Wednesday show how a capacity for creativity, self-expression, and joy can be found in the most damaged and dangerous people. My two final points. We tend to get many important types of decision wrong, reflecting hardwired limits to our mental capacity. And the accounts we give of our prospects and pasts tend to be unreliable and self-deceiving. These final observations are largely drawn from social science. Ever since Daniel Kahneman's Nobel Prize winning prospect theory rejected the rational man approach to economics in favor of a predictive model, there's been an explosion of research into the idiosyncrasies of human decision making. Behavioral economists and social psychologists have demonstrated not just irrationality, but self-delusion in our decision-making. We rely on a set of heuristics which contain systematic biases. We put the short term over the long term. We follow the crowd. We fill in the gaps in our knowledge with what we expect rather than what is there. At the risk of reductionism, an evolutionary psychologist might link our inherent short-termism to a hardwired weakness in our system of perception. Without any clues, such as shadows or context, we have no inherent ability for perspective. We see small objects close by as big as large objects far away. This is a point made by the economic historian Avner Offer, explaining why governments find it harder and harder to win the case for intergenerational transfers. Offer describes a myopic government leading a myopic people. Now, unreliability is not just a feature of our financial choices. The psychologist Dan Gilbert has provided a brilliant summary of research showing how inaccurate are not just our predictions of the future, but our recollections of the past. We exaggerate the degree with which material success will make us happy and the extent to which misfortune will distress us. We're limited in our capacity for prediction. We're limited in the wisdom of our choices, but we are almost unlimited in our capacity to rationalize those choices. We thus create an illusion in which we are able to see ourselves as conscious architects of our own contentment when, in fact, we're simply reacting to outcomes we fail to predict. Another important insight into human perception comes in the work of Steven Pinker, who lectured brilliantly here at the beginning of the month. Pinker shows how the hardwired conceptual framework of language structures our thinking and orders our perceptions of the world into a coherent pattern. Pinker demonstrates how our use of language presupposes a theory of time and space, a theory which we need in order to make sense of the world, but the problem is this is not an account of time and space that would be endorsed by modern physicists. The hardwired conceptual framework of language allows us to think about the physical world while simultaneously distancing us from its reality. So back to the social aspiration gap, the subject of my speech last year. The contingent nature of our view of reality reminds us of the concept of paradigm. A paradigm is a way of viewing the world that's so powerful and ubiquitous that we don't see it merely as a way of seeing the world, we see it as reality. It's only when the paradigm shifts that a completely different way of explaining phenomena comes into being. When Copernicus argued that the Earth revolved around the Sun, his theory was unconvincing to many, not simply because it was heresy, but because he was unable to explain the observable phenomena that seemed to conflict with his theory. Like removing the earth from the center of the universe, questioning our idea of selfhood conflicts with many aspects of the reality we have built. I once heard someone reply to the question, what's it like to be an only child, by saying, I don't know, I haven't got any brothers or sisters. <laughs> Similarly, if you were to ask me what it might be like to live within a different idea of selfhood, I could only reply, this is beyond the imagination of my current self. We can't think of the answers until we can find a new way of asking the questions. But this won't happen simply because research conflicts with our intuition. As I've said, the ideas that I've discussed have been around for some time. Insight must combine with necessity. This time last year, in my first annual lecture as RSA chief executive, I described the social aspiration gap, the gulf that separates our hopes for the future from the future we're likely to create, relying on currently dominant modes of thought and behavior. To close that gap, I argue for a pro-social strategy. Now, I believe a pro-social world would be a much better place to live. But regardless of my preferences, it may also be the only place we can realistically hope to survive and prosper. 
because our species is in the grip of a potentially fatal paradox. Human progress has generated challenges that human beings seem unable to resolve. Science, markets, technology have precipitated an accelerating process of change which has arguably outstripped our capacity to adapt. Now, there are two very obvious examples. The first is climate change, to which we can now link the even more pressing issues of resource shortages. If the billions in the fast developing world choose to eat, drive, or own half as much as we do, economic turmoil and heightened conflict over access to resources are inevitable, with climate disaster following fast behind. We simply cannot go on living like this. Another example concerns population aging. The current rate of increase in life expectancies in most parts of the world is remarkable. By the time I finish this 30-minute speech, your life expectancy will have risen by five minutes, although your will to live may have diminished. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> but healthy life expectancy is not rising as fast, which means a growing care gap. An alien arriving in our country and asked to assess our degree of civilization would surely be shocked. How can we treat a status to which we all presumably aspire in that we'd rather not die young as some kind of social stigma? And how is it that when so many of us will end up vulnerable and in need that we don't see the current state of care as an intolerable scandal? This is not just a matter of failing to empathize with people who are different, which is problem enough in itself, but not empathizing with the people we ourselves going to be in the very near future. An echo there offers myopic public. Overall, we seem to be in a painful and uncertain transition between the people we are and the people we need to be. We are resistant to being governed, but we are unwilling to govern ourselves. We like the upsides of globalization, but we find it hard to live with the challenges and responsibilities. To say we are citizens of the world is as obviously true as it is obviously premature. We've gone from simple needs to complex wants, but we don't seem to have a clear understanding of what we actually need to live fulfilled and responsible lives. Now, against this background, and often in response to specific policy challenges like tackling binge drinking or promoting recycling, there's been an explosion of interest amongst policymakers, like David, in behavior change. And however welcome may be small changes in behavior, my contention in Einstein's phrase is that we cannot use the same tools to solve problems as we used when we created them. Civic engagement, self-sufficiency, and altruism cannot be won simply through exhortation and incentives. They require a more fundamental shift. Basil Fawlty famously introduced his wife thus. Meet Sybil, specialist subject, the bleeding obvious. It may be that all my observations deserve Basil's barbed, barbed response, but it's equally obvious that few of them are influencing the way that we live our lives and organize our society. In a long tradition upheld by figures from Schopenhauer to John Gray, there are those who deride the illusion of selfhood. Human beings are simply a particularly destructive species, suffering from the delusion they can control their destinies. Gray believes we can never catch up with the forces we've unleashed. He says, technical progress leaves only one problem unsolved, the frailty of human nature. Unfortunately, that problem is insoluble. Most of us adhere to the reverse argument. There is no problem. The self that has created today's challenges is the self that will resolve those challenges. And alongside these positions, there are various forms of traditional and new age mysticism. These tend to suggest the only way to save ourselves from ourselves is to opt out of the mad egoism of modern society. Now, perhaps it's a reflection of my moderate reformist politics, but I'm interested in a moderate reformist agenda for selfhood. I have this evening been talking about some very big ideas, and I want to add a much more modest one of my own. The combination of public understanding of brain and behavior science, along with an awareness of the social aspiration gap, will not lead to an overnight revolution. But these insights and these circumstances could provide the context in which age-old questions can be heard afresh and new answers provided. Let me just give you three examples. There was a famous experiment conducted with the students from Princeton Theological Seminary. The students were divided into a group which studied the story of the Good Samaritan and a group that read unrelated Bible stories. On leaving, the students' route to their next class took them past a stranger who clearly needed help. Would there be any difference between the two groups? The answer is no. Instead, the variable that best explained why some students didn't stop was that they felt they were in a hurry. The point here, one by, made by Daniel Goldman in a TED lecture, is that thinking about compassion did not make it more likely that people would be compassionate. 
What did was simply that the less busy, less self-absorbed students were open to our hardwired capacity for empathy. Our brains contain mirror neurons which fire in sympathy with other people's emotional state. It's natural for us to empathize. It's spending so much time thinking about ourselves and our busy lives that obscures a hardwired capacity for other regarding behavior. To be more compassionate is less a matter of conscious will and more about having the kind of life that leaves the time and space for empathy. Think also about the implications of a more critical perspective on the idea of identity. It's clear from what I've said that a lot of what we say about who we are is a self-serving, fatalistic rationalization. Similarly, most of what we have convinced ourselves or allowed ourselves to be convinced will make us feel good is unlikely so to do. If I put you in an environment that encourages and rewards cruelty, I'm likely to find out some disturbing things about the person I thought you were. But if you get the job you dream of, the salary you aspire to and the partner you lust after, you're unlikely to attain the sense of well-being that comes from the unself-conscious flow of painting a watercolor, tending a garden, or practicing a craft. In the debate about whether it's possible to live sustainably without sacrificing our quality of life, surely these insights are profound. And I suggested earlier that if our thoughts and behaviors are subliminally conditioned, our sense of separateness looks problematic. Indeed, I believe that one of the great confusions of modern selfhood is to mistake difference for separation. We are all a unique combination of our genetic inheritance, our conditioning past, and our present context. But our thoughts and behaviors are the result not so much of the ways we are separate, but of the ways we are connected to the world and to other people. Fifty years ago, Galbraith talked about private affluence and public squalor, reflecting on opinion poll data that shows we are massively overconfident about our own prospects and massively overpessimistic about the state of society. I recently suggested the phrase private optimism, public despair. But when we compare the illusion of individual autonomy with the reality of the deep connections between our minds and the social world they inhabit, we should perhaps speak of private myth and public blindness. The theory of social capital points to declining participation in the institutions that used to foster civic collaboration and social optimism. But human beings have not lost the capacity to collaborate, and it is the mission of creating civic institutions that reflect today's expectations and lifestyles that I've described as the new collectivism. So, can we change how we think about ourselves? In part, it will depend on whether these questions enter public discourse. The RSA intends through its new project, Changing Minds, to bring these debates to a much wider audience, in part through fostering multidisciplinary dialogue between neuroscientists, social scientists, philosophers, policymakers. As part of this project, we want also to apply new insights about the brain and the self to public policy fields, such as education, criminal justice, sustainability. Already, pension policy is being guided by behavioral economists. Social marketing campaigns are based on the insights of what Robert Cialdini calls the new science of persuasion but change could be much more far-reaching. Imagine schools returning to the old idea that they're there to shape character, but doing so now by helping young people to develop a more accurate idea of who they are and what it is that's likely to give them fulfillment. Imagine a prison designed constantly to reinforce the capacity in all of us for altruism and empathy. Imagine a mental well-being policy that enable every citizen to tend a shared plot of land or to develop proficiency at music or a craft. Imagine a society that gave as much attention and invested as much resource in public spaces as it does to private accumulation. Shaping the public debate is important. But at the frontier of brain science, we're also bound to see a steady flow of developments which will continually undermine our common sense idea of selfhood and our assumption of an unchanging human nature. The aim of altering mental states by directly impacting on our brain processes is not new. Psychotherapy, brain surgery, antidepressants, they all go, back some, all, some, all go back some time. But if new science enables just some of the practical applications it advocates promise, we could soon see our mental capacity as being no more a fact of life than our waistline. Findings on brain plasticity emerging from the work, for example, of Elizabeth Gould at Princeton suggest the brain is much more affected by the environment than we previously thought. Awareness of the impact of stress in early years on cognitive capacities already have an impact on how policymakers tackle social injustice. More and more of those things which we thought of as a function of mind, of thought, and of, of will may come to be seen as physical processes which can be affected by direct neural interventions. Take two very different examples. Human memory is notoriously unreliable and suggestible. UK, uh, US researchers are now suggesting that court witnesses could be wired up to brain scans. 
While a witness might say in good faith that they saw something, observing the neural pathway will show whether the recognition is real or imagined. What then is memory? A conscious recollection or a physical process? Some chronic pain patients are being helped by real-time brain monitors that enable them to see the signals going to brain receptors and then actually learn to reduce their experience of pain by experimenting with ways of blocking these signals. Sociologists, most notably Anthony Giddens, identified reflexivity, our capacity to reflect on and shape our own lives and identities, as a key component of 20th century selfhood. Neurological reflexivity, the capacity directly to shape our mental processes, may be a key feature of the 21st. So, the wonders of science, the necessity of action, a richer public discourse, these are key ingredients of change. Paradigm shift is messy and complex. It's only later that historians overlay a unify narrative. But one day, might historians look back on the 21st century and talk about the dawn of a new enlightenment? And just like the enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century, might this involve a change in popular experiences of selfhood? After 250 years in the ascendancy, is the Western idea of selfhood reaching the end of its Icarus flight? Might it be the time for a conscious, separate, reasoning self to fall back into the ground of a more holistic conception of being? Is it time to recognize and promote the role of other members of the cognitive assembly? Intuition, empathy, spirituality. If this sounds far-fetched, let me quote a recent review of the emerging literature in the New York Times. In unexpected ways, science and mysticism are joining hands and reinforcing each other. What if a personal response to climate change can only come from reconnecting ourselves with the material world in which we are embedded? What if strengthening communities from the local to the global means releasing our deep yearnings to be part of something greater than our meager selves? What if coping with living longer lives in a time of complexity and abundance means recognizing the contingent and often imprisoning nature of our individual identity, but the unchanging and simple sources of human contentment? For those who think it's far-fetched to suggest we need fundamentally to change, to survive and prosper, well, you could do worse than read Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. Diamond charts how many human civilizations have fallen precisely because of an inability to adjust their beliefs and behaviors to the changing environment around them. To fully express our potential as human beings and to give more back to the world than we take out of it, these are enlightened aspirations. We won't fulfill them by abandoning the power, insight, and confidence of the Western self. To understand better who we are, to abandon some of the myths and mistakes of modern selfhood, is not to submit to our evolutionary limitations, it can loosen their binds. As the chief executive of Royal Society, let me end with this suggestion. Might it be that we only see the full, amazing potential of our conscious self when we stop believing its claim to be the absolute ruler of the dominion of the mind, and instead see it as a more humble and accountable head of state. Thank you. <laughs>